Welcome to the very first episode of A Journey Through Cinema, where we look back at the history of film and the must-watch movies from every year, alongside notable cinematic achievements. For this first episode, we're going to speed things up a little as we look at the time period between 1878 to 1915, with the birth of the film medium. The year is 1878, and Edward Muybridge uses a series of 24 cameras to photograph a horse in motion. Offered rumor to be part of a bet to see if all legs would leave the ground, Muybridge would create the Zoopraxiscope projector to display the images in a sequence, creating live-action illusion of motion. This device would be seen by Thomas Edison and inspire him in the invention of the kinetoscope. In 1882, Etienne Jules Murray, and you'll need to forgive me for my butchering of names, Murray created the first motion picture camera, the chronophotograph gun, which quite literally looks like a film reel bolted to a shotgun. In 1888, Louis Le Prince, using a single lens camera of his own design, created the first known film, Round Hay Garden Scene. The movie features a group of people just sort of milling around a garden. Not the most inspiring stuff, narratively speaking, but it was a big leap forward. In 1891, the kinetoscope is invented in the Thomas Edison Labs as the first means of motion picture exhibition. This viewing device was nothing more than a peephole with a small light to view frames. October 1892, Charles Emile Reynaud gives the first known exhibition of a motion picture with his three animated films. Again, forgiving my tongue twister, Pavé Perrault, Un Bon Boc, and Le Clown Assassin. How'd I do? In 1893, the first kinetoscope film was exhibited, The Blacksmiths, directed by William L.K. Dickerson. The blacksmiths in the film were not real blacksmiths, making it the first time a film utilized actors for a fictional scene. 1894, the Lumiere brothers film Workers Leaving the Factory. For a long time, this was considered to be the first motion picture film, despite other films previously mentioned here. In 1894, William L.K. Dickerson creates the first film with synchronous sound. This movie showed a man playing violin as just two guys dance together. Shortly after, in 1895, Dickerson would create the Serpentine Dance, the first colored film using hand-tinted techniques. Meanwhile, Charles Francis Jenkins would demonstrate the first patented film projector, revolutionizing the film exhibition. This would allow the Lumiere brothers to premiere The Watered Watered, a 40-second short film largely seen as the first comedy and first narrative movie. On October 9, 1896, Thomas Edison opens the first movie theater in Buffalo, New York, called Edison Hall. He was nothing if not modest. This year also saw the first female director in Alice Guy Blanche, and the first on-screen kiss, and the first horror movie, The House of the Devil. The first Shakespeare adaption, King John, would round out the century in 1899. In the 1900s, things really start to pick up steam. George Melius releases his most famous film. Now, Melius is a phenomenal artist and maybe the first real auteur, one who certainly deserves his own video down the line. In 1902, his movie A Trip to the Moon made him the father of special effects and delivered one of the most iconic images of the silent era. Some might even claim it to be the first science fiction film. 1902 saw the release of The Great Train Robbery, one of the most influential movies of early cinema, which helped to revolutionize narrative techniques and establish the Western as a long-lasting genre in American cinema. In 1906, an Australian film from Charles Tate called The Story of Gang Kelly became the first documented feature film, clocking in at an hour. Most of the film, unfortunately, has been lost, with only around 15 to 20 minutes recovered. In 1911, the so-called father of cinema and controversial director D.W. Griffith made his debut with the short film in Old California, the first film shot in Hollywood. In 1914, legendary filmmaker Cecil B. DeMille would release The Squaw Man, one of the first features from Hollywood. This same year, Griffith would make his first attempt at the film Birth of a Nation, still going by its original name, The Klansman. This version was supposed to be filmed in Chemicolor, a precursor to Technicolor. He would scrap the entire film when theaters refused to buy the equipment needed to screen it. And this brings us to 1915 with the release of Birth of a Nation. This is a historically significant but highly problematic piece of cinematic history. It's one that's hard to put on any kind of must-watch list given its subject matter. I was actually considering starting this show in the 1920s, 
just to avoid this minefield. Here we are. There is admittedly a, a lot of good that came out of this movie. It helped solidify America and Hollywood as a powerhouse of cinema. It created new filmmaking techniques that are still used to this day. And it brought to life a sense of, for lack of a better word, epicness that no one had ever seen before. This film blew people's minds when it first came out. It was the first bona fide blockbuster. Unfortunately, and this is something often forgotten, this movie came out only 50 years after the Civil War, close enough that Griffith's own father was a colonel in the Confederate State Army and lived through the Reconstruction era, viewing it just completely negatively. As often as the case with bigotry, Griffith likely inherited it from his father. He truly believed in the persecution of the white Southerners by the North and the freed slaves. And boy, did he feel the need to share that. He partnered with author and professional racist uh, Thomas Dixon Jr. to adapt his novel and play The Klansman. Uh, he took very few liberties uh, in adapting it from one media to the other. Griffith is quoted as saying he chose it because he claimed the image of the Klansman heroically riding out to save the white Southerner would be cinematic. He also tried to claim that he was a true friend to the black community and harbored them no ill will at all. There is no getting around that Birth of a Nation is a deeply racist movie rooted in lasting bitterness regarding the great American evil of slavery. The first half covers the Confederate perspective of the Civil War. This segment may be the least offensive and shows off some truly spectacular cinematography and epic sequences of, sequences of war. But it still has such scenes as blackface characters enthusiastically cheering on the very people who would keep them enslaved. The second half covers reconstruction and completely abandons any pretense of objectivity. Here the racism of Griffith and Dixon are on full display. You have a complete rewrite of history, with African Americans taking over and lording over the Southern government, black Union soldiers oppressing whites, and white voters being outright turned away at the ballot box. You have the slaves who remain loyal to their owners being called good ones, black representatives portrayed as dullards or borderline mentally handicapped, and infamously, there's a character named Gus that is shown as a rapist, basically. That's not even getting into the Ku Klux Klan's uh, propagandist role as the heroes to the rescue. This is a movie that reinforced and inflamed generational racism and very likely helped exacerbate and lengthen racial tensions in this country. This is our nasty past on full display. So why is it still talked about? Why give it the time of day? The obvious answer is how massively popular it was at the time. This became the highest grossing film of all time, bringing in $5.2 million by 1919, or 460 million in today's money. It would hold that record for highest grossing film for 24 years until 1939. It was famous for being the first film screened at the White House by then President Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow? Yeah, Woodrow Wilson. It was a cultural staple for its time that solidified America as a big cinematic player on the world stage and helped popularize big budget feature films and feature length movies. It launched the first lady of American cinema, Lillian Gish. Her star went even higher, turning her into one of the biggest names of the silent era. But maybe we can remember it for the small things, like how even for its time, it was still considered controversial and hateful. Even back then, the newly formed NAACP made one of its first significant moves by leading protests against this film. And I can't speak for everyone. But I'd also like to think that it's important to look at our ugly history in the face. It is a keystone of American cinema, for better and a whole lot of worse. How else do we change and move forward, if not by bearing witness to our mistakes of the past? It is a movie that will be forever difficult to reconcile its contributions to the filmmaking art with its role in furthering bigotry and a country's racial divide. And I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, certainly for a first episode, it's, uh, it's not the easiest one, but um, thank you to anyone actually joining me and um, we'll see you next time. Keep those reels turning.